I'd like to start referring back to something that Rob and Richard both referenced. You both showed how now allows us to understand and replicate nature in designs, which has never before been possible. Rob, you showed how this can drive efficiency in materials, creating more sustainable buildings. But my question to you all is, how do you think this approach will impact people that interact with buildings? And do you ultimately think this is going to be a positive or a negative impact in the long term? So can I start with you, Richard? Mm. <laughs> Uh, I think, well, there's a lot of research that, um, you know, biophilia actually has many um, benefits. So there's um, an initial positive response, I think. Um, but there's also a kind of creepy response as well. I think that we often get, you know, that sort of um, trypophobia, insect, um, fractal thing. There's a sort of reaction that we also can have where it, it triggers some other kind of inbuilt reaction. Uh, so I think that's something quite interesting. We've been playing with some of these aspects in our work and um, even in some art I work on. And it's it's quite a fine line, I think. So I think they're both reactions that are instinctive by our relationship with nature already. Uh, but it's interesting, I think, that this sort of engineering and, and adopting these sort of processes can evoke the same reactions that, that nature does um, so I think, uh, in general, I think we should be very positive. Um, but I do think it, it's interesting because it seems to be not so much our cultural brain that's activated, but something much deeper, our sort of uh, uh, animal limbic brainstem or something that, that creates these mm. reactions. And I think so in, that is something quite new in design in some ways, I think, and could be very interesting to study and work with. Interesting. So, Jakob, do you have anything to add there? No, no. I, I just had a question for Richard. Uh, uh, Richard, if when people come and experience your your architecture, your building, is that kind of a cultural different how they experience it, how they experience the nature? Can can you see that, uh, or, or is there any understanding of that? Yes, we've seen some aspect of it. Um, when we were designing some of these projects, we actually took the we had a sort of hypothesis that a very large object that's a building is quite intimidating because it implies there's a sort of um, large bureaucracy or there's a powerful organization behind it. But if there's a large lump of construction that instead makes you think of a mountain or a landscape, uh, you have a sort of different reaction to it. It becomes something that's there and you want to explore. And we've really seen that happen with Park Royal on Pickering, for instance, because it's near our office, so we observe a lot of um, tourists who see it for the first time, and their first reaction is, "Oh, I want to get up there." You know, it, that looks like uh, I would, you know, I'd love to be up there amongst the trees and see what it's like to do it. So, the they sort of go towards the building, and a lot of them actually go in and say, "Can I go up to the garden level and and experience it?" So I think that we we have that anecdotal evidence that there's uh, quite a different relationship to a large planted object than there is to a you know a large granite building for instance i, th I think i had the same experience when i saw your building i'm i'm coming from denmark that denmark is so flat and so gray so i also saw this green mountain and then the first thing i, I want to get up there i want to experience so i think that's also something very cultural that you're attracted for it if you don't have it uh, and you yeah so I think that, that is, uh, that's a great kind of understanding of how nature and build environment is very cultural as well as how I see it. So if I can add, I, I think any building that is some element of biophilic design or some kind of um, biomimicry uh, shapes or, you know, is more exciting than traditional, uh, you know, straight up uh, straight lines building. So uh, I'm not doubting that um, this future kind of architecture will be much more inspiring and will make people uh, wonder more, and make people kind of more um, comfortable, actually, or more happy. I, I think it has that secondary effect. Mm. There is a scale aspect to it, though, because we've been playing with certain things and we realize there's the aspect of the monstrous. So we're used to a certain scale of nature and elements that is um 
we we sort of have an inbuilt sense of what's a natural size of something and if you have something that's particularly large and and um has this sort of natural aspect to it, it it quickly becomes grotesque or monstrous and then you sort of recoil from it so it's like if you're inside a giant serpent or if you're something that feels like an enormous tree but you're shrunk down to the size of an ant it does something strange to the way you react to it so i think you know they're all interesting things to explore yeah i think the um the, as we can see behind Richard's background as well, showing very nicely, you know, all of the natural angles, you know, none of those, there, there's no straight line, there's no right angle. And I think what we'll find through, uh, through you know, these processes, these tools that we're, that we're, you know, effectively still, still in their, I would say maybe their teenage years now, maybe not quite their infancy. Um, but we're going to, we're going to, we, we, we've established we can find efficiency in these natural forms. And I think we'll f start to find more of a blend, a transition between uh, the the old school built environment of of rectilinear extrusions towards the more natural shapes, um, and I think uh, as as the uh, fabrication technology will also evolve and and uh, and and catch up with the the status of the you know the the design technology um, and and enable you know these more complex shape, shapes to be first of all fabricated, second second of all built um with better economy um so that cost drivers don't don't uh, sort of just squeeze everything towards the rectangle um that will yeah i think we'll find more of a blend and i think more engagement uh i like lars's word use of the word comfortable i think we'll find ourselves with greater comfort in uh in the in these in the built environment of the future robert uh, robert, robert i have a question that do you think that it will create the same reaction if you work with like um, structural optimized roof shapes that that imitate like the nature is that given the same kind of understanding of, of nature that real nature does as Richard's projects like like a leaf uh, like looking back at Pierre Luginari like this, this the the structural logic of the forces in the in the concrete and steel do you think that can that can that, that create the same reaction to people um than real nature can do have you any experience of that with some of your projects well, I think um, it, it really depends on what what the, what the direction is and, and effectively how how far we we drive the aesthetics through efficiency. I mean, the efficiency of, of aesthetics is a, a topic that I'm very much uh, excited about. Um, so, effectively, how do things look when efficiency drives everything? Um, and um, sometimes when we look when we sort of study these, it's really it depends on really what the starting the intent of the starting envelope is sometimes things can turn out looking very natural when we drive uh, these processes through them um, very very comfortable sometimes they also look quite alien and it turns out there's not sort of much difference between alien and natural in in terms of engineering design but in terms of how we uh, you know appreciate the two there's obviously a very strong difference in how in the emotion so uh, from from an engineering force and geometry um the two are kind of very similar um but i think you know how, how we how we respond is something that is um uh, i think more time will tell um but uh it's certainly something that we we look at when, when we're looking at studies is 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 actually what 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 reaction what does it what does it uh sort of um what does it look like to us and 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 sometimes you get people you know, some people's reaction will be, oh, it's like a flame or a smoke or something. It almost looks mm. like a fire. Some people will say, you know, forest or x-ray um, and, uh, and and some people trees, even to the same image. It's almost like a raw shark test. Um, so it, it is an interesting topic. Yeah, and I think those forms, the reactions will change over time, I think, because we, when we're confronted with new forms, they don't come with cultural baggage. And so you start reacting individually and some people react one way and another. But I think as time goes on and the forms become associated with certain things, um, you sort of learn to have a shared reaction with the rest of culture. Uh, and so I think that's, that's something quite hard to predict because I think that aspect of alien that you talk about is where you sort of detect uh, that there's order and organization in something, but it doesn't, it's not familiar, you know, so yep. it feels like it came mm -hmm. from an alien civilization. But if you grew up around those things and you see them as human creations, you would just think it's, 
you know, a cultural object that you recognize and understand. Well, that brings us on nicely, I think, to my, one of my thoughts I had when I watched your presentations was that historically, a number of you said we wouldn't have been able to understand these kind of forms and shapes, let alone draw them and replicate them, let alone build them. So I want to pick up on what you were just saying, Robert, about how technology is moving forward. And Jakob, you showed us a number of ways that technology is being adopted in the construction of buildings. So do you think that technology adoption in that construction is keeping up with the evolution of what we can design and what we can create? Um, and where do you think the next steps will be there to actually make these kind of forms a reality and to change the landscape mm -hmm. in which we all live and interact? So can I start with you, Jakob? Yeah, yeah, I think that that is a discussion that we very much have in the studio about that. Mm -hmm. There have been a tradition that architects have been a bit afraid of technology that is have been like 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 pushing us away from from the real craftsmanship. But as we see it, as also as I see it, and I showed in presentation that this is actually a tool to get us back to the building side, or back to the back to the, the we, we call it very much digital craftsmanship. It's a new kind of craftsmanship, but understanding how things can be manufactured like robotic manufacture or digital manufacture, it can actually bring a new way of, of designing uh, into our studio that is not, it's like, it's like coming, it's like very much coming back to the building side, understand how things are manufactured, take more ownership to it. So I think that for, for, for our perspective, that this new technology is not something that makes the, the architecture more alien. It's actually something that makes the architecture more kind of hands-on, one-to-one, and bring some of the, the ideas of architecture back to the studios um, and take more ownership to the whole value chains that have been so in the building industry. We have been so fragmentized that we are doing the design, the engineer doing some structural analysis. And I know that all of our us around the, the screens today are, are trying to, to to merge those value chains, but it's like it's, the industry is very very separate, and there's no those new technologies that can actually make it more streamlined and more kind of integrated. I, I think that is a great potential, but I think it also needs to be described and translated, and it needs to be showed in cases because there is a understanding that technology is something that that we should use to we should be kind of a bit aware of uh, that is. It's not the tradition of, of uh, architectural studio. I don't know, Robert. Maybe I can put the word back to you. I think you have. Yeah. A great no, I was. I was. I was. Uh, yeah. I'm very happy for, to to continue from that. I think. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I totally agree that one of the great powers of computational design uh, is is going to be to be able to integrate the constructability uh, considerations at a super early stage in the design process. And actually almost as you, exactly as you're saying, Jacob, to base the design on the criteria, on the constructability criteria. Um, for instance, I mean, we are, we are doing work uh, currently on, 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 you know, modular uh, MMC or modern methods of construction. So, um, and, and in this, we're, we're building workflows where we can take a, an architectural massing, which can, can be a complex massing or, a, you know, a non rectilinear massing and uh, through algorithm, algorithmically slice it so that we can uh, design all of those modules to maximize repetition and to make sure that right from the, 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 the get-go, they're already gonna be uh, sort of um, pre-sliced into, volume, into volumes that, can be, uh, that suit the transportation requirements. So it's just one example of, um, of how you can create this integrated workflow rather than traditional where you would do the design and then you'd pass that over to a contractor to then do that process. And they may find out at that time that, oh, you know, this doesn't work or it's, or you've got to make substantial changes or it's going to be very inefficient. Computational mm -hmm. design allows us to have this informative approach where we can consider the entire process, the, the entire construction process um, from start to finish at a, at a very early stage um, and base designs upon the driving criteria. And I think this is yeah, super powerful. Uh, thanks, so Robert. I think that Sorry, last just yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was just saying. I mean, you, you almost have to decide, you know, how you're gonna um, fabricate uh, the the components uh, before you start the design because uh, it's one of the main criteria. And so, uh, when I look at, for example, three D printing, uh, it's uh, it's like a a technology uh, searching for a purpose. And uh, you know. Once, I mean, in the beginning, uh, 3D printing didn't make any sense because we were still designing uh, you know, straight lines or you know straight walls. And why would you 3D print those? But once you start 
designing uh, more organic shapes, then 3D printing starts becoming relevant. And uh, so if you have that technology at your disposal from the outset, then you can also uh, do your design to fit the technology, the manufacturing technology. And, it, and it'll be an easier easier day for us uh, when uh, when when additive manufacturing, 3D printing has that capability and that cost, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, product. Um, but uh, I mean, at the moment, we we end up doing a lot of work, effectively trying to 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 post rationalize complex design in meaningful ways with this sort of bespoke modularity process. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you know the 3D printing is 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 going to be a, an absolute game changer. Um, when it, when it becomes competitive with with you know what we call uh, sort of you know traditional or even advanced construction techniques that we have, it will be a, a it will be a new curve of of uh, capability for sure. And I, I just have a comment. Uh, uh, <laughs> free, Jacob. I, I would just fully agree with Lars that the, the things that we have seen with three D printing is like like traditional houses coming out of it with doors and windows, like mm -hmm. like. And that is not the way to go. We need to rethink the way that we design that, that, that it needs to change the, 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 the expression. It needs to change the architecture. And, and also agree with, with Robert when, when we, we need to understand the technology before we understand the design. If, if there's a robot that brings bricks together on the building side, we can, it doesn't care if they bring the, the different 100 different types of, of uh, bricks. But understanding that that methodology into our design, we can make a, a facade that is much more uh, diverse and have much more quality in it. So I think that's this understanding of, of going back to the building side and understanding how things are manufactured in new ways that can be 3D print or robotic manufacturing or that and bring that back to the design process. We can do new kind of uh, forms that we have not done before, but with more quality in it, uh, more architectural quality. Richard. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say, I think it's really a difficult transition for the market. And I think it almost needs a starting from scratch business that may totally replace normal contracting. You know, that there's uh, the, it's sort of design and build in-house with the machinery and develop design and build perhaps as something where the whole chain can be re-engineered within a single um, entity. Because at the moment, there's so many um, processes and the division of responsibility and the regulation and the legal aspects that make it really difficult, I think, to, to um, implement this sort of thing. Um, so I'm, I'm imagining, you know, that it could be one of these huge industry disruptors where companies that maybe start 3D printing accommodation, single story, you know, end up becoming the new uh multinational engineering company that does enormous infrastructure projects just because it's impossible for the other market to disassemble itself and put it back together in a way that mm. works with these methods yeah i fully agree with that and um, so what um in the eu for example there is regulation in place that has been uh almost conserving of, it's been kind of protecting traditional methods um uh, and uh, harming innovation and um, as a result because this was recognized a few years ago there is a new regulation that has come out that is about you know innovation procurement and uh, how you are allowed to not procure in the same way as in the past uh, if you have an innovation uh, objective um, so uh, i don't know about the rest of the world but obviously you cannot uh, just go out and find 10 different contractors who can 3D print a building. You, ha you have only one leading uh, contractor who can do it, maybe. Even you might not even have that, but then you have to develop the technology or develop the setup to, to deliver a certain um, ambition that you have, a certain design. So yeah, it's, it's going to be really a, a disruptive uh, thing going forward. And it will need some brave clients too. Yes, that's why I think the client's probably going to be the guy with the machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, there are some big challenges to that adoption and to some fundamental changes we're talking about there to our industry processes and our procurement and all those factors. But there's a statement you said in your presentation, Richard, where you said we have to start trusting the black box. And we are 
inherently a risk averse industry. We're looking for certainty. The consequences of failure are significant, even on just one project. So as an industry, how do you think we will and can overcome these fears associated with adopting technology? And Richard, let's start with you. Yeah, I think it's a real challenge. And I think not only trusting the black box, but also um, the sort of, in some ways, the disappearance of authorship um, mm. from design is also something really threatening and, and difficult to deal with. I think my presentation had a strong thread of that in it. Uh, but I think it ends up like, uh, yeah, we end up having a sort of relation to it like we do to nature again, I think. You know, it, when we look out of the garden, there's all kinds of things happening there at the atomic level and the cellular level that we still know nothing about, but we have become used to the fact that it's a, um, a kind of a reliable process with built-in variation, but we sort of understand we have a sense of what's going on and we trust the outcome and you know like the sun rising every day everyone no one knew how that happened for a long time uh but you you get used to it i think and there'll be some kind of process like that i think where there's trustworthy procedures with testable outcomes uh and we just get used to that that bit being a bit of a mystery <laughs> mm -hmm. Rob, do you want to come in on this? You know, some of the forms sure. and structures and approaches you take are quite unique. So how do you help people get used to those new concepts, new ideas, new thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, fundamentally, I think people do trust buildings. Uh, you, you know, I don't think, I think, you know, the, the codes of practice that have been established for, for you know, a very long time, um, people expect their buildings to, to do what they're designed to do. Um, and to the point that people don't really realize almost how buildings are designed. Um, and I, you know, even when I explain what my job is to, 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 to friends and, and people outside the industry, they, you know, they might come back and say, oh, so you're an architect or it's like, no, 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 it's, it's slightly different. Um, so, so the engineering of buildings in itself is kind of almost so trusted that people don't realize it happens, um, which uh, which I always find interesting. Um, so, but I think in terms of uh, in terms of the you know the, some of the form finding uh, and uh, more complex uh, sort of geometric work that we do, I see this as a, as an additional layer of design work that's that sort of precedes all of the standard and and all of the other checks that that would normally happen. So in effect, actually, it's it's additional layers of 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 uh, of testing. Um, everything that we do, all of the geometries that we that we uh, that we uh, discover or, or or end up with, they still go through the same process. Um, and part of that part of that process has been to you know find you know very good ways of being able to export models into and geometric models into industry standard software that has been used for a long time and is 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 the most uh, you know. Uh, reputable uh, and trusted um, sort of platform for building design across, you know, multi, multi multiple, multiple, um, well, across the globe, really. Uh, so there's no change there. Um, the uh, in terms of in terms of the analytics, um, the the complexity is much more, I think, in in the constructability of things at this point, and that's where I think we're seeing the transition. Uh, the, the the hardest transition. I mean, I think uh, maybe about maybe five five years ago or a bit more. I think that it was probably a time where an architect could probably draw any shape, and they'd uh, you know maybe approach a uh, an engineer and and they'd say, "This is what we're after. Can you design it?" And the engineer would have to sort of um, they'd have to simplify the design so they could analyze it. But around about five years ago, I would say somewhere around there is is when uh, engineers are caught up and uh so at, at that point i remember sort of telling people you know any shape you draw we can analyze it now we don't need to simplify it um we can analyze any shape it doesn't mean it's going to work but it, it's it we can we can analyze it i think the next step on is where almost is the constructability aspects of that um so that any shape can be uh constructed and and also competitively uh costed so um yeah, I, I don't. I don't think. I, I don't think. I, I just see. I just see these processes as additional layers of of security, almost. Um, or at least it's 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 not 
the, the, we're still using the same processes to, to validate structures that we were beforehand. It's just that we've added more design intelligence preceding that process. But Robert, I can sort of imagine a scenario in future with so, so many sort of multi-factor um, things being pumped into the programs and, you know, mid-journey being hooked up to yep. biomorphic structural design. And then, you know, say you threw in a whole lot of hazard analysis to like planes being flown into the building and things that would also be factored into it. I could imagine in the end, you would look at a plan and go, I have no idea what that thing is for. And maybe if you sort of unpicked all the processes, you would find yeah. it was from when the plane crashed into it, this thing was a failure. And so this thing was enormously enlarged, but it would be so complicated. And with so many yeah. processes, it would essentially be a, a kind of incomprehensible plan, but yeah. you would know that it was the most optimized for this enormous list of parameters. And at that point, I think we would sort of start to lose any sense that we understood the building as we as professionals do now. I'd agree with that. I think mm -hmm. fundamentally, uh, we still need to have a very strong concept to our designs. Um, and uh, I think, I mean, I think computational design and, and what you just described there, Richard, sounds very, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like a good outcome. Um, I think, I think, yeah, you know, real time adaption and not understanding why things are, are done for certain reasons, it would be, would be a, a bad, um, would be unfavorable. But I think one of the, the great uses of computational design is actually being able to distill very clean and clear concepts um, that use more complicated geometry to achieve them, but they have an underlying, a uh, very simple logic to them, a very simple um, uh, concept. Uh, and I think that's over the last few years of, of going in this, this computational design journey through structures, actually, we found our, our concepts become much purer and more distilled and also more aligned with the architectural vision. And actually, mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, the architectural vision can align to the structural, uh, to the structural concept. Um, and, and I think that always helps. I think this is where uh, engineering and architecture has to kind of come together and be developed uh, as, as one. Um, being a structural engineer, I, I can see there's a lot of learning that we have to go through. Um, and if you if you look back in time, you know there were books, thick books written about just how to design a concrete beam or a steel beam. And now we have to design something that is uh, not a beam but something else. And there will be a lot of learnings coming. Uh, I think one principle that we have to that is healthy to apply is kind of the hierarchy. Of structures. So, if you are designing a, a, a very big structure, you first design the basic uh, mega structure. Uh, as you said, Rob, it's it's something that is simple and you you can understand as an engineer. So you trust that this is uh, designed in a way that will work, and then you design the secondary items and the tertiary items and so on. So there is a hierarchy to that that you understand each of them. Jakob, do you have any thoughts on this? How do you see your clients overcoming this and, and the challenges that come with adopting this technology? We are, we are very much looking into what we call generative design. This is what Robert is saying, that we put on a lot of parameters and then we make the algorithm come up with the answers. But it's not the answers that they come up with. They come up with a span of solutions, like 10,000 different solutions. And... What we do with our client is to, to actually say that this is not coming up with answers, it's coming up with design directions, but the, the client very much look like the overview that they can pull in one step and say, we want more square meters, then the volume change into something new. So they can act, act, actually benchmark the business case with all those iterations. I think that that is the way forward to use those algorithm and technology to get the overview or get the understanding of, of the, the business case and the parameters and, and the risk in the projects. Uh, so that is that. That is how we how we use uh, generative design or parametric design is is not to find the, the optimized answers. But no, no one have to. I agree with Robert because if you find the optimized answer, no one can explain why it's up it's the most optimized one. And we need the storage <laughs> and we need the concept behind it. But we can use the technology to understand the the parameters and where 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 does it really have an effect on the on the environment and the, the business case and the risk uh, and that that's how i see the technology that is not something we should be afraid of we should use it to to create better architecture more sustainable architecture <laughs>